This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. Well, hello once again. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget to follow us if you can and tell all your friends about us as well. My special guest this week began his illustrious career in entertainment in 1971, playing in, of all things, a rock and roll cover band before he formed Smith & Smith. From 1978 to 2006, he created, produced, and or starred in four television programs, including Smith & Smith, Me & Max, The Comedy Mill, and the legendary Red Green Show. In total, 581 television episodes. He also produced several TV specials, PBS fundraisers a theatrical release feature film in 2009 he released his biography titled we're all in this together and has an honorary doctorate from mcmaster university as well he is a member of the order of canada steve smith it's good to see you my friend it's been a long time a i long was thinking time. about that i gotta be 30 years don't you think I, I think Maybe. it was, I, I was, I was on, and I'm trying to think of which, which, which one of your, would I have been on Smith and Smith or the comedy mill back when I was still doing yeah. stand up? I can't remember. That would have been Smith and Smith. Yeah. Well, that yeah. was probably yeah, 1980, 1980. That's 42 years yes. ago. Yes. <laughs> 42 wow. years actually. Yeah. I think I think wow. that was one. I think that was my first appearance on television doing stand up, and I, and I'm very wow. grateful for that to this day. Uh, I'm happy to, happy my, to help my, out young talent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody's called me that in, in a long, long time. Uh, uh, it's funny, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, people can't see where we are, but I, I live in Mississauga, in Streetsville, which is a, the village in the city, uh, several blocks away from where you grew up and, and less than several blocks away from where you went to high school, at uh, Streetsville High School. Oh, yeah, no, I know that town well. I had a 1950 Pontiac. And it was a bit sketchy, and I would drive to school and coming down that hill. And I remember one day there was a guy, his name was Mike Kime, and he was walking down the sidewalk, and he was a friend of mine. So I stopped the car, and I said, do you want a ride? He said, no, thanks. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I didn't realize that, uh, speaking of school, that you taught elementary school back uh, in, in the late 60s. I did. I taught for two years at Gladys Spears Elementary School in Oakville. And I always mm -hmm. tell people I saved I saved an entire generation by quitting. What what grade did you teach? I taught uh, my homeroom was one year was grade five, the next year was grade six. But on the, in the afternoons it was rotary, so you got five, six, seven, eight. Right now, it, it, let's assume you were the you were the same age then, or that you're the same age today as you were then. Would you mm -hmm. do it again? Would you teach again? I, I honestly, I think I still am. I don't think I ever totally left that profession. I, I, I think I have a particularly a particular point of view that I clothe in comedy and silliness, but yeah. uh, I, I think there's a message. I, one time I, I did it when I was touring, a, a woman came up to me after the show and said, you, you tell us what we need to hear and make it funny. So we'll listen. And I thought, well, that boy, that really, that was nifty. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about it, I mean, and, and I've also often thought to myself, had I not gone into to comedy and then eventually in, into radio, that I would have liked to have been a teacher. And when you think about it, the, the similarities between being a performer and a teacher, there are a lot of them. Because essentially, teaching is entertainment. And if you can get a student's attention, whether it be through uh, just your delivery or through your humor, bang, you got him as a student. Absolutely. I agree with that totally. Uh, you know, and you got, they got to connect with you somehow. They got to either like you or find you amusing. Yeah. So you, you, you had left after a couple of years of teaching and, and I guess your foray into the, into show business was what, 1971 in a rock cover band. 
Yeah, we we had started in the early mid '60s. I'm going to say there was a coffee shop opened up in Streetsville, just across from across the railroad tracks. There are the ones the Go Train goes on now, and uh, so we formed yeah. a little six piece group, uh, kind of like the new Christie Minstrels kind of a deal. So that that really started, but mm-hmm. it was only part time, and you know you we get. I remember we played the first job we played there was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, and uh, we got paid a hundred bucks for all six of us for all three nights, and we were just ecstatic. Mm-hmm. Show you can't beat show business. Yeah, and then in yeah, seventy one, exactly. Yeah, in seventy one, I went that that morphed into a rock band, and in seventy one, uh, we went full time in that, and that's really, really the last job that I ever had was uh, nineteen seventy one. So it, it was. It was. A, you were you. A, you a cover band for any particular. You weren't a tribute band, as they call them. Like you didn't play just Led Zeppelin or just the Beatles. You no, covered we, everybody, right? Everybody, and we would have co- costumes we put on to imitate, you know, the Beach Boys or the Four Seasons or what have you. And I remember I had an epiphany in that band, and probably three years later, at that point, we were doing a lot of U.S. college work, and um, we were at Cornell University, and and coming out to see us was. Uh, was the manager of Deep Purple. And uh, usually when somebody important, as you know, Ted, somebody important comes to see you, you just stink the joint out for some reason that night. Well, we had a great night. We got three encores. I couldn't wait to meet this guy. Yeah. So after the show, he comes backstage. I said, well, what'd you think of that? And he said, well, it was interesting. I said, interesting? What do you mean? <laughs> he said, well, he said, you did the Four Seasons, the Beach Boys, you know, the Mamas and Papas. He says, I know all those groups. They do what they do better than you do what they do. So what do you do? Yeah. And uh, within <laughs> si- within six months, I uh, my wife and I had left the band and started. I started writing our all our material and and away we went. And so that's how Smith and Smith was born in back in in nineteen seventy four, right? Yes, that's exactly the, right. the idea. The idea was to produce a, a a variety show focusing mostly on comedy. Yeah, I th- I think the model was probably Sonny and Cher. Looking back at it, and I'm not sure we were that yeah overt about it, but I think that's what we were doing. Yeah, well, that, that, that would make sense. You get two attractive people with a good sense of humor, and obviously you could sing to a certain degree because yeah. you, you did make money on it. Yeah, yeah. My wife was the singer, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we did that, and and we had perform we had. Got a job to be an opening act for Al Martino. Remember him? And uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So we were at Hamilton Place. That was, and we didn't know it, but if we had stunk that night, that was the end of the tour for us. But we ended up going across Canada with him. But anyway, when we got back, uh, I ended up going in to see uh, Frank Denardis was the general manager of CHCH, and uh, oh, I wanted to pitch us doing a pilot. And he said, before you get started, um, I was at the Al Martino show. And uh, I thought you guys were great. And he says, if I don't give you a television deal, somebody else will. So, that, and and for all those years of Smith and Smith, uh, Frank and I just it was a handshake. I'd go in and we'd have a have a chat, and then he'd shake my hand. And he said he'd say, send me a piece of paper that says what I just promised you. And so I got something in my filing cabinet <laughs> to refer to when I have to pay you. And that's just the way it was. Yeah. And it's it's sad that it got to the point where where a contract wasn't enough, but it w- but it was a great start. The management and, and media management in those days is so much different uh, than 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 the landscape today. Uh, yeah, there was more risk being taken. I think back then, I think people figured, you know what, why not? But today, it seems like it's it's too. They, they don't want to take that kind of risk. The bean counters get nervous. I think maybe it's just gotten a lot tighter. I, I like CHCH, that independent station in Hamilton. They made money yeah. from from day one, so they they were they were working out of a, an atmosphere of affluence. You know, they could afford to to, to risk and lose, and and right. the government had stepped in and said they had to spend a certain percentage of their you know on the Canadian contest. They had to do something, so they you know they, it wasn't like now where they I feel like everything they do, including their Canadian, has to get a big audience and, and be profitable. Right. So Smith and Smith went on for uh, what six years. We did, I think, I think it was seven and a half. It was a, The first season we did 13 episodes and then we did uh, maybe seven years. Yeah, seven years of, of uh, 26 episodes. So it was 100, 195 altogether. That's a, that's, a, that's, that's a lot of episodes for, for one season. When you, when you consider today, uh, so many television shows come on and they do like 10, 15 episodes and, and that's it. 
Yeah. Back in yeah, the day, yeah. they used to do 20s, 20s and 30s, and right? Because you wanted to get to that magic number of 100 episodes so that you could eventually go into syndication because I think 100 was the number that people were looking for, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and when we we had we syndicated that show in Canada, so that 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 gave us a little longevity too, because the station had money coming in, not not just going out. Mm-hmm. So from from there, the next one was me and Max once again on CHCH. Now, how did that come about? Well, uh, probably my wife wanted to, to do do something more along the sitcom line because what we were doing, the variety show type thing, was kind of going away. And uh, yet we couldn't get any more budget. So we had to figure out a way to do a sitcom uh, on the same budget as our little two-person variety show. So we we mm-hmm. uh, corralled our two sons and <laughs> made them do whatever we said. It didn't last long, but it's good for one season. Yeah. Comedy Mill came around in, in 87 and in 89. Uh, at, at that point, uh, comedy has becoming more and more popular and more and more prevalent uh, because... People don't realize now, you, you know, you're walking downtown to Toronto and, and there's like five five or six different comedy clubs. There was a time back then before the before it all started up in the late in the late 70s. There was really nowhere to go to do stand up. comedy. No, that's right. Absolutely right. It just yeah, it just, it's really it's really blossomed. And uh, people see uh, stand up comedians as as the, the new intelligentsia or maybe it's not that new. Maybe the court jester started it, but. They, they see comedy as more than just something to make them laugh now. It's, it, it makes them think and sometimes yeah. reflects their, their opinion, which they like to hear in a funny way. I read an interesting article uh, recently about um, the late night talk show host and, and the type of comedy that they deliver. And the person who wrote the article, and I don't recall where I read it, but was saddened by the fact that they said, you know, there was a time when, when Carson and some of the other people who were doing these monologues would talk about virtually everything. And now it's like so much of it is focused in on politics and the divisiveness of the United States. A lot of that became true because because of Trump, where it was like everybody was doing Trump jokes. And after a while, it's like, OK, geez, enough already. We need to talk <laughs> about something else. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. I, I, I've really stayed away from that. There's a lot of reasons why I'm not a mainstream entertainer. I, uh, one of the great blessings of my life is that I've found enough people that share my point of view and sense of humor that I've been able, been able to have a career, but I don't consider myself in that milieu at all of being political or trying to get people to not like each other based on differences of opinion. I, I go the other way. I mean, yeah. our, our show is still on the air. The Red Green Show is still running. We've got a channel in Canada somewhere, and, and uh, it's because we never talked about what was going on, and it, was ju- it wasn't just because we didn't know what was going on. It's because... Uh, we we wanted to, to deal with more fundamental uh, principles. Well, the Red Green Show. There's there's so many f- fascinating uh, aspects to the Red Green Show I- I itself. First of all, it started off on CHCH. Uh, PBS picked it up at one point. Uh, Baton, which was uh, CFTO, I guess back then. Right. YTV, Global, and CBC. I mean, it's like you had like four or five different homes uh, during the course. Mind you, the show you produced 300 episodes, which is yeah. incredible. Yeah. Well, CBC was the that was that was the real breakthrough. We we every year we tried, and finally after our sixth season, uh, the new had a new programmer there, Slaco Klimq, who you may remember, and he was just sure. terrific. He 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 was he was a godsend to me. Uh, in fact, when it when it came to the, I decided I didn't I didn't want to do uh, any more than fifteen seasons. And after the after our thirteenth season. Uh, we met with Slocko in at, at, at uh, down at Natpe, and anyway, it doesn't matter. And um, I said to him, I, I said, I know you're only thinking about next year, but I said, what I'd really like to do is I want to do two more seasons. That'll give me 300 episodes. I'll be turning 60. I know an off ramp when I see one. So he said, let's write up the contract. Let's, I'll give you a two year contract. Like nobody does that in television. And what that did for me was, no, it, it allowed me first of all to write so that I could wrap everything up. I knew when the show was going to end. Secondly, I could let the cast and crew know we got two more years and then, you know, we better look for something else to do. And it was just, it just made it so much more pleasant. And, you know, it's funny, I was talking about how the show bounced around and everything. We had a live audience at CBC and uh, one night a guy says to me, how did you ever sell this show to a broadcaster? I said, I didn't. I sold you to an, I sold you to an advertiser. <laughs> 
More of the Ted Walsh and podcast after this. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ATP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with a loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387. That's 1-866-309-0387. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Hey, it's Ted Wallison for Tom's Place, and we love offering incredible deals. We're open for business and, more importantly, on sale. Check out our website, toms-place.com. Dot com for details about our specials and ours. We have no supply chain issues. We are fully stocked. In fact, we have huge amounts of inventory that we want to move, and the deals are simply amazing. Prices lower than ever in the 60-plus history of Tom's Place. Shirts, sweaters, coats, sports jackets, suits, and more priced to be given away to you. And we've got gift certificates as well. Tom's Place Boxing Week sales on now, Kensington Market. So now, more than ever, you know it's important to shop local. Thank you for your support. Tom's Place, the Boxing Week sale, will suit you. Now back to Ted Walshin. Where did the idea for the character of Red Green come from? Did, did you ever meet anyone like Red Green in, in your life? Is, is that is that sort of the, the inner Steve Smith? Is that the real Steve Smith coming out? Uh, you know, it, it, not initially, uh, initially I was making fun of Red Fisher then, and this is during the old Smith and Smith days. I'm talking like 1978, 1979. Yeah. I created this character because he had this show, you know, Scuttlebutt Lodge and, and, uh, yeah. he was a fishing show and he'd, he'd ha- sometimes he'd have a show that he didn't catch any fish, but he'd, he'd run it anyway. Cause that's what, that's what they shot, you know, and, and he, and he wrote <laughs> his own poems and everything. And I just thought, this is great. This man thinks nothing will bore you, you know. And so that was that was the premise, yeah. and so it was this caricature of. But Red he was so Fisher. likable, the, the thing, right? Red, he was he absolutely so, so likable. Yeah, he's just a kind, gentle man, and he'd have Ted Williams on every other week, and and they were buddies, and they'd yeah. have a bottle of scotch and go catch something, usually the yeah. flu. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but it's funny, Ted. You know, I, like I say, it was a caricature up until. I was doing the show by the by the third season. We had a live audience, and as soon as the live audience came in, it changed everything. I could feel when I did something or said something that, in their minds, Red Green would not say or do. So I had to make the character real and consistent, and and that that was a big shift. Yeah, do you, do you think that that kind of a program could have existed, would have existed, at that time in the United States? Well, yeah, yeah, I, I think it could have. I mean, we ended up on on PBS, and at, at our zenith, we had I think 120 stations, and it it was a it was a really good uh, fundraiser because people who liked it knew they they couldn't see it anywhere else, and and they would they would pay money to support it. You know, I used to, I used to go on there and and uh, help them pitch, and I would say. Um, if you enjoy the show, uh, send in a little bit of money. And if you don't enjoy the sh- show, send in a whole lot of money so they can buy something better. <laughs> and that kind of, it would, it would kind of yeah. disarm. The, I would say uh, PBS is educational TV and the Red Green Show is recess. You know, stuff like that. It was kind of irreverent. Yeah, okay. and, but we raised a lot of money for PBS. And how many people thought that Red Green was really a person? That it wasn't oh, man. Steve Smith in character because I, I'll give you I'll give you a quick example. I did a show okay. years ago for CBC, and and Mike Myers was on it, and he introduced. I think it was the first time he did uh, his character um, uh, on on television. Uh, Wayne from Wayne's World. Oh yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And we had we had a small audience, and and he came on with his long wig on, and he's wearing jeans and a sweatshirt, and we finished the shoot, uh, and you know the cut. 
makeup goes off, starts getting the hair comes off, and and there's a couple guys sitting in the front of the audience. They freaked out. They couldn't believe that this <laughs> that he wasn't who he was. That it was an no. actor playing this character. They thought that my, yeah. my God, it's it's not. There's no Wayne. There's no real Wayne. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get the same thing. Of my voice, uh, kids will come. Up, Why are you talking like that? You're, you know, you're red green. You're not supposed to talk like that. So I, get, yeah. we get people when they want to come to Possible Lodge for their honeymoon. You know, which is <laughs> frightening. But, uh, they, they, they want it to be real, and I, and in, in, in their minds, it is, and in my mind, it is too. To be honest with you, where did the, the duct tape come from? Well, um, and this is going to sound really business like, but I'm a great believer in brand, branding. And uh, one of the things, I read a book in, in 1982. I've read others since then, but uh, it was oh, about good. how to position, <laughs> <laughs> how to position yourself. And one of, the, one of the tricks was to, if you can associate your brand with a bigger brand, then, you know, it'll help raise your awareness. So we had a big meeting with CBC and PBS, and we had a book publisher at that time and a, a distributor. And I wanted, we all sat around a table and I wanted them to find out what could I associate red green with that would help boost the brand? And they all gave suggestions, which I ignored. And, and I decided that red green was the human form of duct tape. So if I could associate red, every time people saw duct tape, they'd think of me, that would help the brand. And uh, then we approached 3M and they came in as, as a sponsor and, uh, and away we went. Brilliant. My producer, Paul Gatt, who's listening right now as, as we're chatting, uh, one time you were in, in the radio station at CFRB and you came in and I guess, uh, I think it was his, for his father-in-law, he got, got you to sign a roll of duct tape for his, for his oh, father-in-law, yeah. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done that uh, thousands, thousands of times. And it's amazing. Like the people that enjoyed, enjoy the Red Green Show, it's so hard to define that demographic because they're, I mean, you know, a Notre Dame professor or, a guy digging ditches and they seem to have that in common. I don't know what it is. Independence. I guess. Yeah. Do you think that, that if red green were to be born today, that you, you could, red green would have been a big part of social media because I could see a red green, uh, Twitter thon going on with just with people who believe, especially those, because there are, there are those who don't believe that the red green exists. And then there are those who believe that red green exists. And yeah. just the battle between the two of them on social media would be interesting uh, and of reading. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, for me, the, where I'm at now with my career uh, is it's never been, things have never been better. It's never been a better opportunity to access your audience. I, one thing that uh, I've come to is I, I don't want any more middlemen. I've had middlemen my whole life, agents and managers and advertisers and broadcasters and all that stuff. And when I started touring in 2010, I'm suddenly, I'm dealing with the end user. That's the customer there, sitting there in the audience. Anybody who doesn't like me isn't there. Uh, and I just, I just enjoyed that. It's such a comfortable atmosphere to be in. I didn't have to finish the show and then wait for the overnight ratings to come in. The ticket, yeah. the ticket sales are my ratings. So now with the internet where you can, we, I have over 600,000 followers on Facebook. I mean, that, that just, I mean, that, that's just a fantastic base to work from. And talk to me about the Possum Lodge podcast. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, this is something that I'm doing with my son. Uh, we call it a podcast because podcast is the, the word now, but it's not a podcast. It's a radio show. And it, it harkens back to when I was a kid, we didn't have a TV. And I would lie in bed with a crystal radio using the bed springs in our bunk beds as an aerial and listen to, you know, our, <laughs> our Miss Brooks and Burns and Allen and all of those. Yeah. And dra dramas, music, everything was on the radio. <clears throat> so I had to imagine the pictures. I had to imagine the set uh, and the characters and everything. And it, I think it's one of the reasons that, that my imagination developed because it had to. And I, so I wanted to do something like that as, in, in my latter years uh, that forces people to try to imagine what we're doing. And uh, our podcast even has like handyman corners where, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll uh, turn a, a dryer into a hot tub, you know, it's just stuff like that. And you, you have to, the sound makes you picture it, you know, but uh, I'm really enjoying it. I, I, I like working with my son. The whole, the whole show is 100% scripted. And I, like I was saying before about 
and then my focus now on the end user. It's totally subscription based. Uh, I'm not allowing advertisers or sponsors. If we can't get enough subscribers to do it, we shouldn't we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. It's interesting because really the, the successful radio over the years, even after the radio became more than what it was or less than what it was, it's always been theater of the mind if it's done properly. Even top 40 Absolutely. radio, the, the, the best top 40 disc jockeys were the guys who could paint the pictures as the Beach Boy song was, was the, as the build up to the Beach Boy song was playing in the background. You could, you could see him describing the beach and what was going on at the beach and everything around it. And, and that's what it is. So to me, this sounds exactly what you've done here is you've taken that original radio idea and gone back to the concept of theater of the mind. That's exactly what it is. You know, and I just, um, Another thing is that we today everybody multitasks. They're out jogging while they're listening, or they're driving their car while they're listening. These are things you can't be watching a TV show or a movie while you're doing those things. So, in some ways, it, it, you have more opportunity to get listeners than than if you're doing it on TV. Are you still writing? Like uh, for books? Yeah, I, are you I, writing? I, no, no more books. No more books. I did eight books. Uh, I'm done. I'm done with that. It's a I. I one of the reasons I, I started touring was because uh, I got a, I was playing golf with the, the president of Random House, and he said, any book you wanted to write in the red green character, we, we would publish. So I went, okay, well, I'm flattered, but if I say no, he'll never ask me again. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I wrote a book, and then they wanted me to do a book tour. You know, when you write a book, you have to do a book tour. Yeah. Which means, you know, you go to Saskatoon to sell 10 books, and I said to him, I'll buy 11 not to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> but instead yeah. of that i thought well if i'm going to go out there anyway i might as well i'll do a one-man show while i'm there and and do the book thing as, as a side lane. in the afternoon i'll do the thing at the bookstore and in the evening i'll do a performance you know in the in this in the hall and uh and that's 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 how my touring career started hey i would i would i would always imagine how awkward it would be if you release the book and you go on a book tour and you go to your local Coles or whatever, whatever bookstore you, you're, you Coles still around? I don't even think they're around anymore. Uh, no, I don't think but so. you want to, and nobody shows up. Yeah. Or you sell like two, like you, like you say, 10 books, but you sell two books. Yeah. And you're oh, thinking, what am I, I doing here? Oh, there was one in, uh, in New York, the, like the Random House obviously is international and they, they had released the, the book in the States and we had used it as a PBS pledge thing. And they have this thing where they take a big auditorium and all of the attendees to the conference are there and they, they, they put maybe, I'm going to say 10 writers at a desk side by side across the stage and whoever wants a, a, an autograph will, will walk up. So what you don't want to be is the guy that has nobody coming up to their yeah. desk, you know? So, I mean, I was shocked. Uh, I had a lot of them come up to me, but most of them were getting the book signed for somebody else, which <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of as a, <laughs> ha as a hallmark of my fame. <laughs> yeah. I don't like it, but my <laughs> uncle sure does. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. This is this is for somebody else. Either that, or they're too yeah. embarrassed to admit that it's that it's for yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you, you were bestowed an order of Canada, or an order of Canada, I should say, back in two thousand six. Was that a shock to you? Oh my God! When I when I found out I was getting the Order of Canada, I thought everybody must be getting one. <laughs> it was it was amazing. <laughs> I <laughs> I took my mother. Uh, I took my mother up there, and uh, oh my gosh, my mother, by the way, in in a couple of weeks is turning a hundred. So we all have wow. bedroom apparently. Yeah. Well, good for her. Good yeah, for her. Yeah, she's awesome. And, and what was what was the ceremony like? I mean, w were you nervous because you're a guy who's used to standing up in front of thousands of people, so it shouldn't be nerve wracking. But by the same token, I'm assuming it's the first time you've had one of these given to you. Oh my God, yeah. It's just I, I was I was honored, you know. And, and and to be honest, Ted, like the you know, the, it's a bunch of people getting it. It's not like just me there. No, you know? it's not like a, getting the Oscar. So, and they do you. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a gang ceremony. So, but. You know the the governor general and, and and my mother who's kind of a royalist i mean she was just she was out of her mind with meeting the governor general and, and it was just it was a it was a great honor uh, i was humbled by it that it didn't last long but it, at least it was a nice break uh and and it's just i don't know i've had a few things like that where uh i, I have a very positive feeling about life in general and that sure didn't hurt yeah 
And, and compare that to receiving your honorary doctorate from McMaster University. Yeah, that was. Well, I mean, that I'm was not saying one's better home. than the I other. Lived, yeah. No, yeah. I know, but it, I, I probably, on a personal level, I, I, I probably enjoyed the McMaster one more. But as far as a, an honor is concerned, there's no comparison. But in, in fact, prior to that, I had received an honorary doctorate from uh, from Wichita, no, Topeka, Kansas, Wichita, uh, Washburn University in Topeka, and uh, they gave me a doctorate duct tape. And and McMaster <laughs> gave me a McMaster gave me a doctor of letters. So now when I sign my name and S after it, I put D D T D F L. Doctor of duct tape. They That's should they me. should they should have given you a diploma and and had it torn in, in a corner and, cut, yeah. and, and taped taped over with duct tape. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They missed an opportunity there. You, uh, Steve Smith is my, is my guest. You, your biography, which you wrote back in 2009, my gosh, that sounds, feels like 100 years ago, called yeah. We're All In This Together. How open were you about, with, with that? Because I've, I've often wondered when people say, I'm going to write a biography or people are asked to write a biography or an autobiography, whether, they're, whether they hesitate because everybody has something in their life that they don't want to talk about. But if you don't mention it, are you being honest with your book? Yeah. Okay. So I was totally open and honest. And the, the book actually is a, a 300 page interview by Meg Ruffman. So she was guiding where it was going. And I just, I said to her from the beginning, I've got to answer these questions honestly, or there's no point in doing the book at all. And of all the eight books I've written, that's the one I'm most proud of. And, and when people come up to get it autographed, I always sign my own name, not, not red green. It's not a red green book it's a, yeah but red green's in there you can tell you can tell you know so yeah yeah i'm I, I i you're right and there's some stories in there that i would have preferred on one level not to have told but you you gotta you know you gotta you gotta let the whole thing if you're trying to help people you gotta show them that you know there are problems too it's not it's not all roses no true enough but but by the same token sometimes withholding information is a better thing to do because you hurt people and i'm not saying that you did in your book i'm saying but but you can you can be hurtful without meaning to be hurtful and yeah, i don't want to get too I, heavy here but no that's a that's for me that's a slippery slope because uh now i start coaching and editing everything and before you know it i'm prime minister yeah okay that's a good point um the touring no more touring at all now that the covid is almost gone or i guess some people think it is gone is there any, any inclination whatsoever to maybe take your, your radio program on the road? Do no. Do a live version? No. 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 Uh, you know, I, one of the things that, that keeps me up, you know, keep, keeps me happy and positive is that I can do something like I did my television show for 15 years and then stop and just have it as a great memory, not something like, Oh man, I wish I could go back and do that again. My mind says, no, you've got to be constantly what's next, not, not what you've already done. There's no point in right. going back and trying to relive something because it, it effectively shortens your life. It, you're repeating. It's a rewind. I don't want, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, when I did my last tour, which was called, this could be it. Uh, the response from the audience, uh, uh was just so fantastic. I mean, 90% of the shows were sold out, not that they're huge venues, but, uh, I wasn't going to top that. And the feeling in the air was just so fantastic. And people were so kind to me and told me such great stories about how the show had affected them that I didn't mm -hmm. want to demean that by coming back and saying, you know, I'm, I'm just another hack entertainer who pretends and ends up doing right. five farewell tours, you know, goodbye already. When yeah. my guests say they're leaving the house, go, don't, don't come back in for your hat. <laughs> just keep going. Yeah, really. I'll email you your hat. Yeah, I'll give you your hat, exactly. Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I I think I understand what you're saying. It's it's like the attitude where I don't want to live in the rear view mirror. Right, exactly. And somebody, you know what would be worse? If I went out and did that and, and somebody said, oh, your, your, your last tour was way better than this, you know. I had a friend who saw Tim Conway twice and he wished he hadn't seen him the second time. So I didn't, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be in that category. Well, you hear about uh, musicians, you know, like Sinatra in his, in, in his last few appearances, you know, forgetting lyrics uh, yeah. to a song and, you know, repeating lyrics. And you think, oh, my God, that's, that's so painful to watch. It's, I, I don't want to see that. 
No, and it, it, it's a reminder that you're on the same path. I said, like, oh, man. <laughs> well, there's that too, yeah. Reminded remind that I'm old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, precisely, precisely. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's been a real pleasure chatting with you. It's been a real pleasure watching you and being entertained by you and 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 uh, all your cast of characters and your family over the years. And thanks again for the the break back in in the fifteen hundreds or whatever it was that we were when we, first, <laughs> when we first met. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me, and this means a lot to me as well, Steve. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ted. Take care, my friend. All the best. There you go. That's uh, Steve Smith. The great Steve Smith, the master of duct tape and more. So once again, thanks for being with us. If it's your first time here, we appreciate it and hope you come back and hope you recommend our podcast to, to your friends. And don't forget, follow us. Also, don't forget, if you get a chance, go online, fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.